So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you all for coming today. My name is Yuriko Otomo, and I'm the director of the Global Research Network, which is a home for PhD students and early career scholars. Our members run a think tank, including the Programme for Animals and Biodiversity. While we're waiting for people to arrive here, please um, get yourselves a cup of tea, and I will tell you a little story. So I grew up in the 1980s in Hong Kong. <clears throat> this is where animals were slaughtered in the street, in open air markets, and where vegetarianism wasn't even a dirty word, it was completely unheard of. It was there one day in a public library that I came across a, a book with the title Animal Liberation. The idea was so shocking that I didn't dare take out the book on loan, but I returned over the following days to read it in the library, sitting there in, in a corner, and it gave it gave words to my feelings, and it was so clear and so persuasive that it determined the course of my life. I went to Australia and I did a law degree at Melbourne University, and there was no law animal law available there, so I couldn't take it. I wanted to do a PhD in animal law, but there was no one to supervise me. And so I did it in international law. It was there that I remember the academic community mourning the loss of Peter Singer when he left for Princeton and Australia left, lost one of its greatest thinkers. Over the last 20 years, everything has shifted. So animal laws commonly taught across all the universities around the world, veganism, vegetarianism, these are mainstream diets. And when I started the Global Research Network some years ago, animals and biodiversity was the theme that the majority of academics were interested in. And to date, it has also been the most active. Ankita is one of our fellows, and when she proposed that she organize a world moot on international law and animal rights, I was delighted to agree to support it. At the launch of this moot, I'm so pleased that Peter Singer is able to be here to see the power of an idea, to see that his idea, well argued, has indeed changed the world. Now, uh, welcome everyone. I hope most of you have now arrived. Uh, please note that this is being recorded with a live stream running on YouTube. We'll be picking up questions from both this meeting and the live stream, if you're watching there, from the comments section during the discussion. So please do post questions. Um, I'm handing over now to Marine Lassier, who is Regional Director for Northern, Western and Southern Europe at Wimla. Thank you very much, Eriko, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here today as the original director for Northern, Western and Southern Europe at the WMLR. Today isn't just any day, it's the day we kick off an event that's all about the often to wide gap between the scholarly world of legal theory and the urgent real world needs of animals. First of all, I would like to express our gratitude to the Global Research Network Think Tank for their support in making this event possible. Special thanks to its director, Dr. Yoriko Otomo, whose commitment and belief in our cause have been instrumental. We are truly grateful for their partnership. To our audience watching online, your presence means the world to us. You're not just attendees, you're advocates, enthusiasts, and the very heartbeat of our movement, the animal rights movement. Thank you for standing with us today. We are also blessed with an exceptional lineup of speakers who are nothing short of revolutionary in the animal rights field. We extend a heartfelt thank you to Peter Singer, Gary Molecki, and Paula Sparks for lending their expertise and insights to our cause. Your work inspires us, and we are all ears for the wisdom you are about to share. Welcoming you all today on behalf of the incredible WMLR team is such an honor. Together, we are not just launching an event, we are laying the groundwork for a sustained movement that aims to shape the future of animal law and train the next generation of animal lawyers. Working with such inspirational individuals has been an amazing experience and we are just getting started. To every one of you, Thank you for your commi commitment to advancing the cause of animal rights within the framework of international law. Before I pass the stage to Ankita Schrenker, our founder and director of the WMLR, 
I would like to request that all participants use the chat function to engage in constructive and respectful dialogue. This is a space for us to learn from each other and move the conversation forward. So now it's time for me to introduce someone who's not just the brain behind the WMLR, but a true pioneer for animal rights law, Ankita Schenker. Ankita's vision, leadership, and commitment to advocating for animal rights within the international legal framework have brought us all here today. Her innovative approach and ability to mobilize action and uni unite towards a common goal of advancing legal protection for animals are nothing short of inspirational. Today, she'll be sharing our insights in a presentation titled, Why Animal Rights? And Kita, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, for that introduction. Thank you, everyone who has taken time out to be here today to help us launch this event. I am so happy to see you here and so pleased at how far we've come from the point where the Vimalar was an idea in my head in summer 2022, to the point where the Global Research Network agreed to support us in 2023, to the point where the excellent team that we've put together started joining our ranks one by one, and to now, when we are finally launching the Vimalar. For my presentation, I want to focus on the topic, why animal rights? Why? Because animals are sentient beings. It is beyond doubt that many species experience pain and suffering, love and joy. Yet animals are subjected to abusive treatment in the form of breeding, capture, captivity, exploitation and slaughter on a massive scale often in manners and contexts that would be considered unlawful if done to humans. While human personhood and fundamental rights are widely recognized, protections for animals are far from adequate. And in order to successfully issue adequate animal protections, the respective interests of humans, animals, and the planets must be fairly balanced. Driven by our mission to ensure full recognition and protection for animal personhood and rights, the Vimlar equips future lawyers to effectively advocate for the interests of animals through an understanding of the intricacies of interdependence, competition, and conflict that exist among the inhabitants of our planet. Without such holistic understanding, solid legal arguments cannot be made and legal battles cannot be won. The primary objectives of the Vimlar are to train future generations of lawyers in animal rights research and advocacy from a globalized perspective, and to highlight issues of animal rights and their interrelationship with other global concerns, such as human rights and environmental protection. Secondly, the Vimalar aims to ensure the unified rather than fragmented development of global animal rights law as an emerging field. And finally, the Vimalar aims at cap capacity building in regions with developing mooting and animal law. We do the former by offering training to mooters and coaches and by encouraging easy access to moot court participation at accessible basis in geopolitical regions across the world. And we do the latter by introducing animal law everywhere, including places where it is a new discipline so that law students can engage in the debate and the formative stages of their careers. But of course, animal rights and welfare implications for our, the animal rights and welfare implications of our treatment of animals are exceedingly clear. Today, though, I also want to highlight the relationship between animal exploitations and other areas of global concern. You can see these areas listed on the slide, some of the areas that I've identified pertaining to human health, the environment, and food availability. According to the FAO, Antimicrobial resistance is a major global threat of increasing concern. Two thirds of the estimated future growth of usage of antimicrobials is estimated to be within the animal production sector. According to the UNEP, 
zoonotic diseases are increasing rapidly and human activities such as animal product consumption, animal agriculture, domestication and selective breeding of animals, taming of animals, encroachment into wildlife, loss of biodiversity, climate change and others are the main drivers of zoonosis. And according to the WHO, the greatest risk for zoonotic disease transmission occurs at the human-animal interface through direct or indirect exposure to animals and their products and or their environments. The UNEP has also noted that on average, one new infectious disease emerges in humans every four months. And this is where a lot of statistics come in. So please find the references on the slides as it will be impossible for me to read them out in the time that I have. Millions of deaths per year are attributable to zoonosis, 1 billion illnesses a year, and this is uh, for humans. 75% of new pathogens detected in the past 30 years, 75% of emerging infectious diseases, and 60% of infectious diseases are zoonotic or originate in animals. Various independent organizations, such as the ones on this slide, have found causal links between the consumption of animal products and serious and even fatal human health conditions, such as Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, neurotoxicity, osteoporosis, and others. According to uh, these sources, including the WHO, Chinese-style salted fish and processed meats are group one carcinogenics, meaning that their links with cancer are as conclusively established as for tobacco or asbestos. Red meat is a group 2A, which means it is probably carcinogenic. According to the WHO, the risk increases with the amount of meat consumed, but the data available for evaluation did not permit a conclusion about whether a safe level exists. Dairy products have been found to be not or minimally linked to benefit to bone health, but have been found to be linked to weakened bones, fractures, and increased risk of prostate cancer and earlier death. Eggs have been strongly linked to cardiovascular disease, to high cholesterol, to diabetes, of which they increased the risk by 68 to 165 percent, and a deadly form of prostate cancer, for which they increased the risk by 81 percent. Meat, whether red or white, has been linked to high cholesterol, and seafood has been linked to toxicity from environmental contaminants, for example, neurological toxicity from methylmercury, sources on the slide. Then we have blue zones. Blue zones are regions where residents on average live the longest and healthiest lives. And the diets of blue zones, interestingly, are primarily, if not exclusively, which is 95 to 100%, in fact, plant-based. According to the most comprehensive study of nutrition ever conducted, whole food plant-based diets are better for health, sources again on the slide. According to another study, 25% of life on earth, that is 1 billion species, are under threat of global extinction as a result of human actions. The, and uh, according to this study by Diaz et al., the rate of global change in nature during the past 50 years is unprecedented in human history. The direct drivers of change in nature with the largest global impact have been, starting with those with the most impact, changes in land and sea use, direct exploitation of organisms, climate change, pollution, and invasion of alien species. So we aren't just affecting human health, we are also affecting the environment and contributing to the Anthropocene extinction through our um, exploitation of animals. The UNEP has found that the destructive impact of animal agriculture on our environment far exceeds that of any other technology on earth. The green gas footprint, greenhouse gas footprints of animal agriculture rivals that of every car, truck, bus, ship, airplane, and rocket ship combined. According to Cowspiracy, animal agriculture is the leading cause of species extinction, ocean dead zones, water pollution, and habitat destruction. Further sources have found that 77% of direct agricultural land use, that is excluding the crops um, that are grown to feed livestock, 
come from animal agriculture. However, animal agriculture only accounts for 37% of the global protein supply and only 18% of the global calorie supply. 45% of Earth's total land yet is dedicated to animal agriculture. And 91% of the destruction of the Amazon rainforest is attributed to animal agriculture. One to two acres of land is cleared per second, which results in the loss of almost uh, of nearly or around 137 species of flora and fauna per day. More sources have found that 20 to 33 percent of global freshwater consumption comes from animal agriculture, that 65 percent of global greenhouse emissions from food products are attributable to animal agriculture, and this is excluding supply chain contributions, and 51 percent of global greenhouse emissions come from animal agriculture. More sources have found that 90 percent of um, Marine fish stocks were fully exploited as of 2018, of which 29% were overfished or depleted, 40% by number and 80% by waste. Annual discards um, account, uh, are accounted for by global marine capture, or, uh, or <laughs> global marine capture results in annual discards, and 640,000 metric tons or 10% of marine litter is ghost fishing gear, and this was as of 1997. Obviously, that uh, number has increased exponentially between then and now. Some statistics that are gathered from the website of uh, Cowspiracy in relation to food av availability. So now we have um, animal exploitation not only affecting human health, affecting life on the planet, affecting the environment, but also affecting food availability among humans. Humans grow enough food to feed 10 billion humans. That is more than the number of humans that we have on the planet. However, at least 50% of all grain grown worldwide is fed to animals reared as livestock. 82% of starving human children live in countries where food is fed to animals that are then eaten by Western countries. Which means, um, in some in some statistics, when we convert that, we can see that 37,000 pounds of um, plant-based food can be grown on 1.5 acres of land, whereas only 375 pounds of beef can be grown on um, 1.5 acres of land. Whereas 5.2 billion gallons of water is consumed daily by humans, cows consume 45 billion gallons. 21 billion pounds of food. Um, are, is consumed by humans every day, and 135 billion pounds of food is consumed by cows. So what's the solution then? Well, it seems pretty obvious, right? At the societal level, we must end the exploitation of animals and their habitats. And at the individual level, we must end our participation in such, otherwise known as going vegan. According to the Vegan Society, veganism is a way of living which seeks to exclude as far as possible and practicable all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. Which means that everyone, everywhere, can go vegan. My form of veganism might not resemble that of somebody living in a different part of the world under different circumstances, but as long as we all do our best, truly our best, to end animal exploitation, to end our participation in animal exploitation, then we can call ourselves vegan. Veganism is our future because it's the only way we will even have a future. Thank you. And now I will give the floor to Altamush Saeed, our deputy director, who will introduce the Vimalar and what we're uh, how we are organized and what we stand for uh, dear Ankita and marine thank you so much for that wonderful introduction to Wimlar and the essential question why animal rights i ultimate say deputy director for the world mood on international and animal rights or Wimlar, and the northern america regional director will now further delve into the execution side of Wimlar. Uh, the Wimlar is an ongoing project on which work began in 2022 and which will be open to participation from end of February 2024. 
After that, the Vimlar will run annually ad infinitum. The Vimlar is a mooting competition and also offers training courses on mooting from experts to develop a strong mooting culture. The moot competition will be in person in collaboration with our amazing regional directors and host universities in every region. The training course, depending on signups, is planned to be hybrid for accessibility concerns. Students have the option to choose between the two streams, and there is no requirement to pick both of them. The mood competition runs over a course of two days, and the sessions can be parallel if needed. Participant law schools can send one team up to four participants each to compete at the re respective regional chapter of the mood for first to third place in the respective regional. First place winners of the regional chapters will compete, compete against each other at the international rounds on 10th of December, which is the International Animal Rights Day. The training course aimed at coaches and mooters from regions runs over a span of three days in the form of certificate workshops from experts. And as mentioned before, will be delivered in a hybrid format. The mooting competition will have an initial region round, regional round in eight regions throughout the world, followed by an international round in December 2024. For the first year, the language for the competition would be English, with the possibility of other languages contingent on sponsorships, as we do want to make this truly accessible and why animal rights is something that is a part of all of us because it is our future. Tentatively, registrations open on 26 February 2024 in all regions, alongside the release of competition handbook, the problem, the score sheets across all regions. The same mood problem will be used in the regional rounds. And to keep the competition fair, the regional rounds will be reported in a closed setting and will be uploaded later. The international round will be streamed live. The Vimlar operates on the regional level in collaboration with leading law schools across the globe in eight regions. So far, partnerships have been secured with the Vermont Law, Vermont law and Graduate School, George Washington Law School, University of Prania, Chile, Birmingham City, Helsinki, Osijek, Western Cape, Silesia and Katowice, Kangwon National, the National Academy of Legal Studies and Research University, and gentle global green university further partnerships are currently in various stages of the negotiation and the idea is to have at least two institutional bases bases in each geopolitical region to ensure maximum accessibility at the international level the vimlar is hosted by the global research network and now i will delve in tell you more about our amazing team and introduce them okay uh, so our international team, which we call as the headquarters, includes Ankita Shankar, who is the founder and director. Then we have me, who is the deputy director. Sana Mehek, who is head of legal affairs and communication. And Shreya Padakon, who is our head of content creation. And the wonderful Imogen Swed, who is our intern. Uh, in region one, which is North America, I currently serve as the regional co-director, alongside Michaela Singer, who is the other regional co-director basically have been created from an accessibility purpose, and they are different for every region, depending on the university cycle in those particular regions. So for North America, uh, the closing of registrations will happen on 14th October, alongside the release of the mood problem and, and, and the agenda, and, and scholarships, which are contingent on, on, uh, on sponsorships. And we have 11 November 2024 for our memorial submission deadline, followed by 18 to 20 November for, uh, for the training courses, which can be hybrid as mentioned before. Then we will have our regional rounds, which will take place between 21 to 22 November, 2024. And on the 23rd of November, 2024, the winners will be announced. As, as mentioned before, our two hosts from Northern America are George Washington and Vermont Law and Graduate School. For region two, we have Latin America and the Caribbean. Our co-directors include, regional co-directors include Angie Vega and Maria Francisca. As mentioned before, the dates uh, for the timeline for all regions are different depending on the university cycle. So for Latin America, the closing registration is on 6th May, followed by the memorial submission deadline on 3rd June, 
and the training and the uh, regional competition from 10 to 12 June and 13 to 14 June respectively, with the winners announced on 15 June 2021. And as mentioned before, our hosts for Latin America are University of Prania and University of Chile. For Region 3, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, we have Cheslin Craig Caesar and Michaela Tafani, who serve as regional co-directors. And for the Sub-Saharan Africa region, our closing registration will happen on, on the 8th of April, followed by the memorial submission deadline of 6 May, and the competition from 13 to 15 May, which is the training, and 16 to 17 May would be the regional competition rounds. And the winner will be announced the next day on the 18th May. The host for this region is the University of Western Cape. For Region 4, which is not Northern, Western, and Southern Europe, uh, we have Marie Lercier, who's our regional co who's our regional director. And the dates for this region include 21st October for the closing of registration, followed by the memorial submission deadline of 18 November, and uh, the training courses and the regional competition from 25 to 27 November to 28 to 29 November, followed by the results the very next day on, 30th, on the 30th of November. And the hosts for this region include Birmingham City University and University of Helsinki. For region five, we have, which includes Eastern Europe, Central and Western Asia, and Northern Africa. We have uh, Ramon Afana and Iga Glazevska. Uh, the dates for this region include, uh, for, for the closing registration is 22 April, followed by the memorial submission deadline of 20 May, and the actual competition from 27 to 29 May, which is the training part, and the 30 to 31 May is the regional competition round. And the results will be out the next day on the 1st of June. Our host for this region is the University of Osijek. And for region six, uh, which is Southern Asia, we have Amin Garg and Dul Dulki Sitawaka. Sita I apologize for that uh, mispronunciation. Uh, so the, the timeline for this region is 7th October for the closing registration. And the memorial submission deadline will be 4th of November, and the rounds will take place from 11 to 13 November, which is the training again, and 14 to 15 November would be the competition, and the results will be out the next day. And the hosts for this region include Jindal Global Law School and Nasser University. For Region 7, we have Eastern and Southeastern Asia, and our director, regional co-director for this region is Hambit Sung. And the host for this region is Kangwon National University. The closing of registration for this uh, for this region is 29 of April, followed by the memorial submission deadline of 27 May, to the training courses from 3rd to 5th June and the competition from 6 to 7 June. And the results will be out the next day. And our last region is Oceania. And our regional co-director for this region is Jessica Sleepy. Uh, and the the proposed this is a provisional timeline because we have not been able to secure a host in this region but the negotiations are going on so initially uh, the participants might be asked to join the northern america region and the dates for this region are the closing of registration is 15 of april followed by the memorial submission deadline of 13 may and the competition Again, from 20 to 22nd May, which is the training, and the 23rd to 24 May is the regional round, and the final result will be out the next day. And just to mention again, these dates may be subject to change for all regions. Now to thank our sponsors who are making this possible, our, which includes Gentle Global Law School and the Pollination Project. We are extremely grateful for their support and, and, and thank them. Our marketing collaborators, without which this event would not be possible uh, are actually many and we sincerely thank them this includes the uk center for animal law animal law reform south asia south africa apologize apologies planted attorney for animals animal defense partnerships connect for animals environmental animal rights consultants canadian animal law study group world animal justice the Rachel animal and peru and charity doings foundation Thank you from, from my end, and I'll hand it back over to the moderator. 
Thank you for that very detailed presentation. Altamush, just a quick um, clarification or correction rather. The uh, participants from Oceania will most likely be asked to join the Eastern and uh, Southeastern Asia round if um, we aren't able to secure a host and make the necessary arrangements in time. I will now introduce our first speaker, um, the esteemed Professor Peter Singer. And I will invite the audience to write their questions in the Google Meet chat or YouTube chat whenever you wish. Um, you will be asked after the, which will be asked after the presentation during the Q&A. So Professor Singer's presentation is on ethics, law, and the treatment of animals. Philosopher Peter Singer's work on the ethics of our treatment of animals is often credited with starting the, mo the modern animal rights movement, and his writing has influenced the development of effective altruism. He is known for his controversial, controversial critique excuse me, of the sanctity of life ethics and bioethics. He has written, co-authored, edited, or co-edited more than 50 books, including animal ethics. And Peter Singer is the reason I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Ankita. Um, and it's uh, nice to be addressing uh, you all at the launch of this uh, world moot. Um, I do have some slides. Yes, I can see they're, they're up there now. Um, and uh, let's get going with this. What I want to start with, with the next slide, is the mainstream view as i describe it the view that is mostly held in certainly in in most of the societies that i'm familiar with which i suppose are, are western societies but i think is quite widely held if not universally um so it starts with this premise that uh <coughs> it's a good thing to be kind to animals and we should avoid being cruel to them um you can hit the next thing um and that therefore wanton cruelty is bad so if you see somebody hitting a dog or a horse with a with a stick for the fun of it, that's a bad thing. I think most people would accept that. Next. But there's a big but. Next. <coughs> the interests of animals, nevertheless, can be overrun by our interests, that is, human interests. For example, in using animals for research or for food production. And this is what I'm really objecting to. Uh, and I object to it on the grounds that it involves speciesism. Uh, speciesism as a term is intended to make a, a parallel with racism and sexism, which I assume that those of you listening will reject and many other people will reject as well. But in fact, many people still accept the idea that if a being is not a member of our species, that's a reason for either ignoring its interests or at least very steeply discounting its interests as compared to human interests. And I think we should reject speciesism because it is simply another example of a dominant group justifying its exploitation and uh, use of those over whom that group is dominant. And of course, we're familiar with that from the history of racism. Um, take as the most blatant example, perhaps, uh, European racism against Africans, which allowed them to enslave Africans, um, at least in, uh, in the Americas, and um, developed a whole ideology to justify that. And we're also familiar with the male ideology that suggested uh, until really the 20th century in uh, pretty much all countries and still in some countries uh, today, the idea that um, men are dominant over women, that women should do what men tell them to do, uh, that women are not uh, equal. Um, and uh, that also is a ideology which has been widely held and which I think uh, progressive people anyway will now reject. So similarly, we should see speciesism as um, another self-justifying ideology, justifying what is convenient um, and benefits the dominant group, rather than something that has 
a sound and rational basis. Uh, next slide. So instead of speciesism, I suggest this principle, the principle of equal consideration of interests. And I emphasize here that we're talking about giving equal weight to the similar interests of every individual, irrespective of their race, sex, or species. Now, it's true that um, uh, humans have certain characteristics and qualities. Well, this is what people will say. Um, that we use to justify the claim that they're special. So hit the next. Uh, we can go through these fairly fast. There's a whole list here that they're rational, self-aware, autonomous, that only humans are moral agents, that only humans use language, um, that only humans can take part in a social contract. Uh, and I think that's the end of the, the list that I have, but you could probably add to it. Um, and people will say, well, this is why humans are somehow special. But I think the uh, answer to that was given by Jeremy Bentham, the founder of the utilitarian school of, of ethics in uh, the late 18th and early 19th century, when he said, um, raising this very question about whether animals might ever be granted rights, um, he said, the question is not, can they reason? nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And Bentham, of course, thought that they can suffer and therefore looked forward to the day when the rights of animals would be recognized in law. Uh, so he was far ahead uh, of his time. How do we know that animals suffer, we, we may ask? Well, um, there are important anatomical and physiological similarities that um, certainly many animals have with us. Uh, all the vertebrates have uh, similar anatomy and physiology when it comes to uh, the capacity to feel pain, the nervous system, uh, the organization of the nervous system around a centralized brain. Um, that's certainly true of vertebrates. It's, it's Admittedly true that if we look at some invertebrates, uh, such as the octopus or uh, crustaceans, um, those similarities are not so close. Um, so one might think that there was more doubt about those animals. But if we look at their behavior, um, we find the behavioral parallels, I think, uh, are quite convincing. And there are also still some um, physiological similarities in terms of how pain is relayed. So uh, I think that's why the United Kingdom Parliament uh, recently in uh, introducing an animal sentience bill to replace the legislation that uh, did apply in the European, uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom when it was part of the European Union, but um, no longer applied after the UK left the European Union. So they passed a bill uh, recognizing animals as sentient beings and actually expanded that beyond vertebrates to include uh, cephalopods, that is the octopus and squid and, uh, uh, and also decapod crustaceans, which is basically uh, lobsters and, and uh, crabs. So I think that we can say that um, there is a capacity for suffering uh, throughout all vertebrates and at least in some invertebrates, exactly how far we want to go in invertebrates, I think is still somewhat uncertain. Um, and moreover, we know that uh, we have this shared evolutionary history, again, closer with the vertebrates than with the invertebrates, but um, it would be rather strange to think that nervous systems have evolved in humans and in non-human animals uh, in ways that are similar but that somehow have a completely different function, that in humans they um, produce uh, conscious suffering, uh, capacity to feel pain and pleasure for that matter, but somehow in the other animals they don't. Uh, that seems very implausible. And uh, it's been pleasing over the 50 or so years that I've been involved in, in thinking and writing about the ethics of how we treat animals. Uh, it's been very pleasing that science has moved in that direction. That when I first got interested in this, there were some scientists who 
denied that animals, non-human animals can feel pain, or, uh, although even then they were a minority, but uh, they certainly existed. Um, but uh, now it's really hard to find um, scientists who will deny that many non-human animals, as well, in any case, can suffer. So let's move to the next slide. Um, I want to suggest that if we are concerned with animal suffering and with reducing animal suffering, then the issue that we should focus on is the treatment of animals who, who we raise for food and either eat directly, as in the case of eating their flesh, or we eat their products, as in the case of eating uh, milk or other dairy products, or eggs. And that's um, because of the numbers involved. So I'm comparing here in this slide the number of vertebrate animals killed annually in research, which is a relatively large area of animal use, about 200 million animals a year. But compare that with something like 200 billion vertebrate animals only, I'm not talking about invertebrates now, um, killed annually in food production worldwide. Um, and that's a, a UNFAO estimate for the land animals um, and an estimate from uh, uh, an organization called uh, Fish Count, which is uh, produced an estimate of fish. And I'm only talking here uh, of fish raised um, by humans in so-called aquaculture, which is really just uh, intensive confinement uh, of fish in a similar way to we, how we intensively confine land animals. Um, so we're talking about a thousand times more animals used in the food industry and used in the sense that we affect their entire lives than we're talking about animals used in research. And now let's look in more detail at what this involves for the animals. And what you see here is uh, intensive chicken production, which is the way about 99.8% maybe of all chickens uh, are produced in affluent countries in say the United States, Australia, where I'm speaking to you from now, uh, in Europe. Um, very intensive, very crowded, uh, very large number of, of birds. You see something maybe like 20,000 birds in a shed like this. Um, and it's notable that John Webster, who's one of the great um, uh, experts, a veterinarian on uh, a scientist looking at the well-being of animals in farm, farmed animals, says that he regards this as the, the most severe systematic example of man's inhumanity to another sentient animal. Why is that? Well, it's partly because the numbers are so large, but um, it's not only that, it's also be partly because of the crowding that you see here, but it's also because we've deliberately bred these chickens to grow so fast, uh, to put on weight so fast, that by the time they start to get close to their market weight, Webster says within two weeks of being ready to be slaughtered, and they're, they're slaughtered at six or seven weeks. They're, they're really babies when they're slaughtered, but very large babies. Um, at that stage, their leg bones are still immature and it actually causes them pain just to stand up and walk around. And they don't move very much because of that pain in their legs. And yet they have to move if they're going to get food or water. And in fact, it's not even really feasible for them to spend long time sitting down because you can't see it here because the birds cover the floor of the shed. They are standing on their own droppings. Um, and not only their droppings, but the droppings of previous lots of birds who've been raised in the same shed and not been cleaned out between them just because that would cost some labor. And those droppings, uh, bird droppings, are alkaline. And so if there's moisture on the bird's skin or in the air and they sit on their droppings, they actually get a caustic burn um, on their on their thighs and the underside of their bodies. So um, they can neither stand comfortably nor sit comfortably. Um, and that's the life that we have created for these animals in order to make their products more uh, cheaper for us to eat. Next. Uh, if we talk of egg laying hens rather than those raised for meat, um, then uh, a standard method of raising them is uh, in small wire cages like these. 
Fortunately, these have been banned in the European Union and the United Kingdom, but they are still the majority way of keeping egg-laying hens in the United States. Um, and here in Australia too, uh, they are widely used and not illegal. Um, and in many other countries uh, around the world, they are also the dominant way of keeping hens. So this is something which I think really needs to be changed. Um, I think whatever country you're in, uh, it would be important to, if that country has not banned the standard battery cage like this, it would be important to make the case that other nations have, you can still produce eggs um, without these kinds of cages, and they certainly should be illegal. Next. Uh, that's really just another shot of the cages. You see here the, the droppings between the cages that are that's lying there um, uh, and the crowding of the hens. Next. And a third shot of that, um, because the hens are so crowded, uh, they rub against each other and they rub against the wire uh, of the cage. And so you see that this bird has lost most of her feathers from her chest and her skin is rubbed uh, red and raw uh, because of the the crowding uh, that she, you know, she's in this cage for, or basically all of her egg laying life, uh, usually a year or sometimes a little more, uh, until she's ready to be killed. Next, uh, if we look at the pig industry, we also find uh, extreme crowding, despite the fact that pigs are highly intelligent animals. That um, some people who have actually had pet pigs, there's a a website, a Canadian website about Esther the pig you can look at. Um, and you know, pigs can be every bit as much of a companion as, as dogs. Um, and we would not, I think a few people would accept uh, keeping dogs, raising dogs for food in conditions as crowded as this. But with pigs, because very few people do have them as, as companion animals, uh, this is accepted. Um, okay, let's look at the next slide. Even worse is the condition of the sows, of the mother pigs, whose role is simply to breed more pigs for those uh, to be raised for food. As you see here, um, they are commonly kept in these stalls uh, where they can't even turn around. Uh, they can't walk really more than uh, half a step forward or backwards and they can't turn around. Again, this has been prohibited in the United European Union and the uh, United Kingdom, um, but is still used in many other countries. And uh, if you are in a country where this exists and is not prohibited. Uh, again, I think that should be a, a target of activism to call on the government. Why can't uh, governments everywhere have at a minimum the same standards as the European Union? Um, and I'm not saying those standards are adequate. Um, I don't think they are, but um, it's if, if conditions are even worse, they should at least be raised to that level. Next. And uh, finally, uh, looking at fish, I already mentioned that uh, aquaculture is really just factory farming of fish. And again, fish are incredibly crowded. There's really no thought for them as individuals, what their lives are like, and yet they are vertebrates. I think they're clearly capable of suffering and we should not tolerate uh, factory farming of fish any more than we should of chickens or pigs. Thank you. Um, uh, so let me just summarize what I've been saying and add some additional reasons apart from the animal rights kind of argument. There is this vast amount of suffering for animals, but factory farming actually reduces the amount of food available to humans. Um, I think Ankita actually already mentioned that in the remarks I caught. Um, reduces the amount of food available because we grow all this food and feed it to animals who uh, and get back only a small fraction of the food value, whether we measure that in calories or in protein. Uh, factory farming increases greenhouse gas emissions and increases pandemic risk because uh, pandemics come out of factory farming as the pandemic prior to COVID-19. Uh, this was a swine flu pandemic that came out of pig farms. So factory farming is uh, ethically defensible and on several grounds should be illegal. Next. That's it. Thank you. Um, I kept this short because I do want to hear from you. We have a little bit of time for questions and answers, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Thank you. Thanks so much, 
Peter, that was an incredible presentation. And I'm sure many of us are as starstruck as I am right now. So now we'll move to some of the questions from the chat um, and from other platforms from the audience. So people would like to know what drove you to establish this field? Uh, I think it was learning how the animals I had been eating for the first uh, 24 years of my life um, uh, had been treated. Uh, you know, it's it's hard for people, younger people nowadays, to think back to 1970. Uh, I was 24 years old. I was a graduate student, so I'd been through a whole undergraduate course at the University of Melbourne and uh, masters, and and then I'd gone to Oxford to study uh, the graduate. And yet, I had no idea about uh, that factory farmings were already factory farms were already existing, and that I was eating the products of, of factory farms um, in the chicken and pig products that I was eating, certainly. Um, uh, that was just, there was just no publicity, no attention to that. There was one book by Ruth Harrison, I give her credit, called Animal Machines, but it didn't sell very well and um, I had never heard of it until accidentally I happened to meet a Canadian graduate student who was a vegetarian. And he was really the first person who I had met and talked with about being a vegetarian. Um, and he suggested I should read Ruth Harrison's book. I should, um, you know, learn more about how animals were being treated. Uh, and it shattered the sort of myths of uh, how kind farmers are to animals for me. Um, and that led me, firstly, to become a vegetarian myself, but secondly, to think more people need to know about this. Um, and that's why I then started writing about it and, and trying to get more people to learn about the, about speciesism, um, which is not a word I invented. It was invented by somebody else in Oxford called Richard Ryder, um, but I popularized that, that idea. Um, and I think people need to think about uh, the attitudes we have to animals and uh, why we should imagine that we are justified in treating them uh, as we do treat them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Peter. Um, I have a question, uh, and I'd like to know what would be the most effective and sustainable way to transition from animal use in farm production while taking, to a, while taking into account the current financial reliance they are? Well, um, so I think that uh, what we really need to do is to get people away from buying factory farm products and preferably away from buying animal products altogether. Um, and transition to a to a vegan diet, but I don't expect that to happen really quickly. Um, I think there's some hope uh, in the development of new products. Um, we've seen a lot more uh, plant-based products that uh, look like meat and taste rather like meat come on the market, and and that may help because people are so. Um, banned by habit and by what they're used to eating when it comes to food, that it's really hard to get people to say, hey, you know, just stop eating those meals that are centered around meat and think about all the wonderful, delicious vegetarian dishes that come from many different cultures. You know, one of the first things that I did when I became a vegetarian was to explore non-European, non-Western cultures. And one of my, my favorite dish, and I still cook it uh, a lot, is, is dal, um, you know, uh, uh, Indian lentil curry, um, which is an excellent uh, high protein uh, and very tasty vegan dish. Um, but, you know, I hadn't thought about that. I'd never really eaten it. I don't think, um, well, maybe I'd been to an Indian restaurant, or, but I'd never thought of it as something that I would regularly eat. And then there's a lot of, a lot of others, a lot of tofu dishes, a lot of uh, Asian stir fries with, with tofu. There's a lot of other things that um, I'm really very happy eating, but some people are just more conventional. So these plant-based burgers or sausages or whatever it might be um, may be helpful. But... Um, you know, they've got to come down in price. They've, they, they don't quite match the, the meat products. Um, and we've got to get more people aware of the reasons for moving away from, from meat. I think that's what it's going to take. And uh, it's, you know, there are a lot more vegans around, of course, now than when I first uh, heard of this. We, people didn't know what the word vegan meant. Um, but um, it's still a long way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we have another question 
which is, do you believe that the resistance to afford rights to animals is purely linked to financial harm? That could be a symptom of the shift in ethics. And a similar question, which is, what do you see as the biggest threats to the animal protection movement? I don't think the resistance is simply based to financial harm. Um, it's certainly true, of course, that there are huge agribusiness corporations that will put a lot of money into trying to persuade people that um, everything is fine with the way they produce animals. Um, but I think the evidence against that is is just overwhelming. Uh, and so overwhelming that now, at least in some countries, including the United States, in the states in the in the states of the U.S. where the agribusiness industry is strongest, they're actually prohibiting people from taking videos inside factory farms and showing the world what it's really like. So they're, they're obviously scared of the truth. But um, I also think that there is just, as I was saying, there's a lot of conservatism about what we eat, and it's not only because people like the taste but it's also a social thing. We eat together with others. And if um, you know somebody comes home um, and says uh, to their family, I'm not eating meat anymore, um, it's disruptive. Um, it, you know, it causes some disturbance and it implies a criticism of those who continue to eat meat. So it's, 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 it's hard for people to, make, to take that step, I think. Um, you know, when, when I did it, uh, as I said, it was 1970. This was a period of a lot of radical student ideas were, were around, um, anti-war, uh, anti-racism sorts of ideas and uh, gay liberation ideas. Um, and this was kind of an extension. So, uh, so to throw out another radical idea didn't seem so strange then, but, um, but for my, many people in more conservative milieus, it's still very hard to do. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the big barriers that we have to overcome. Thanks. Okay, uh, I have one more question. Um, so, one objection to vegan products is that they are highly processed. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the solution to this? Well, um, not all vegan products are highly processed. Uh, the the, the plant-based foods like burgers and sausages and so on are. That's true. And if you don't like highly processed food, then um, you know, as I say, uh, eat your dal or. Um, stir fry your vegetables um and uh I, you know i don't regard tofu as a highly processed food i mean yes it is there is some processing in tofu of course but it's an ancient food that has been around for a long time um and it it doesn't have a a long list of of ingredients um and some of the burger products uh, certainly do i think if you're choosing between if you like you know you're comparing the evils of on the one hand this food is based on uh an immense amount of animal suffering and very large contributions to climate change, to greenhouse gas emissions. And on the other hand, this this food has a long list of ingredients um, and has taken a bit of processing. I think it's pretty obvious that if you're going to choose between those two, it would be better to eat the processed food. But as I say, you don't need to eat the processed food. And perhaps because I became uh, a, a vegetarian and uh, long before there were all of these foods around, um, I'm you know, perfectly happy eating, uh, as I say, the, the, the vegetables, the, 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 the lentils and, 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 you know, not only lentils, but other legumes, a lot of beans, um, nuts. Uh, there's lots of foods that are whole plant foods um, that we can live very well on. And if people object to highly processed foods, then I encourage you to look at uh, whole plant food diets. Thank you. Okay. We have another question from the audience, which is, how do we argue for the primacy of ethical treatment for animals when there are other competing claims, such as economic, social, or religious, such as livelihood dependency, religious beliefs, etc., which can be injurious to animals? Well, um, so there, there are there are different claims, certainly, but I think that uh, we've often seen um, changes in employment because of ethics, right? We're seeing that now. We recognize the need to move away from fossil fuels. And so um, that will put some coal miners out of work, undoubtedly, uh, but it will create other work for people in uh, clean energy industries like yeah. solar and wind. Um, so uh, I think we just have to accept that that is a kind of a, a transitional cost. It's not a long-term cost. In the end, we'll all be better off. Um, 
we we won't be as badly affected by climate change as we would if we continued with animal agriculture just as if we continued with coal uh, it would be worse um, and there will be st jobs and employment provided um, and similarly with uh, phasing out animal foods there will be jobs provided in terms of producing uh, the plant foods and cooking the plant foods and all of that so it's it's a kind of a, a one-off transitional cost in order to achieve a great and lasting benefit in terms of um, more humane eating the vast amount of animal suffering uh, eliminated and also healthier eating uh, cleaner eating from an energy point of view and from local water pollution as well there are so many benefits that i think they clearly outweigh the costs of of things like loss of employment for for some people in some industries thank you yeah. uh, how do you, Peter, how do you think the most effective way to get the message out to the general public documentary films such as cow by andrea arnold uh, we experience the life of a cow and the audience have the opportunity to feel and empathize with the cow do you think creative artists have it all to play I think that you know there are a whole lot of different ways of getting these messages out, and I encourage people to try all of them. Um, documentaries certainly play a role. Um, some of them attract wider audiences than others. I think uh, a good example uh, is the Octopus My Teacher um, documentary, which um, got people thinking about octopuses as sentient beings. And I think some people who used to eat octopus um, have uh, stopped eating octopus as a result. The problem with some of the documentaries, um, specifically on animal rights issues, is that the people who go to see them um, are likely to be the people who are already supportive of those ideas. And other people, if they know what the documentary is about, they will say, I don't want to see this. Um, and I've had people say this to me directly, you know, don't tell me about it. I don't want to read your book. Don't tell me about it. You'll spoil my dinner. Right. Uh, I think that's a really, when you think about it, that's an appalling thing to say. It, it means, yes, I, I understand that what I'm eating might be complicit with something that is morally atrocious, but I don't want to know about it because then I won't feel so guilty. Right. Um, that's a terrible attitude to have when you think of people who might say that about uh, other things that are happening, uh, atrocities that are happening to humans that they don't want to know about because it will make them uncomfortable. Um, so, uh, I think that that's the that's problem with documentaries. But I think we should try everything. I'm planning to launch a, a podcast um, sometime in the next few months because uh, that's another way of reaching people. I recognize there are more people getting information uh, through the internet, through podcasts now than, uh, than there were before when originally it was much more uh, books and articles. But I'm continuing to write. Um, I have a little book about uh, turkeys coming out in the United States before Thanksgiving, which I hope will lead some people to uh, have a vegan Thanksgiving um, rather than a, a large dead turkey, which is almost, again, almost entirely factory farm turkeys. Um, uh, so um, I think we just have to try whatever we can to get that message across. Oh, and one thing, I saw a survey where people who have become vegetarian or vegan were asked how they learned about it. And actually, the largest single number was from a friend. Um, so, you know, I'm an example of that. Um, and, and apparently that's still continuing. That uh, so, so talk to your friends. Don't be too shy about talking to people about why you're um, not eating what they're eating. Oh, wow. A podcast yeah. would be wonderful. Um, OK, then there's another question from the audience, which is, in your opinion, what would be the country to take as an example regarding animal well-being in the agribusiness industry, if any? Yes, um, I don't know that there really is, uh, is any country that you would really want to hold up as an example. Um, as I've said, the, the European Union and the United Kingdom are a little bit ahead of most other countries in their legislation. Um, and there was a move in the European Commission to completely ban cages, uh, uh, or not only for like uh, for hens and pigs, but also in the fur industry. Uh, that would be very good if it happens, but I'm not quite sure whether it is going to happen. Um, so I tend to look up to those those countries as um, as taking the lead, but um, you know they've still got a long way to go too because they're still factory farming on a large scale. The, 
the chicken photo that I showed you of chicken meat production. Um, pretty much that is pretty still standard in Europe. They haven't moved away from those very rapidly growing young chickens. So um, no, there's there's nowhere that we can look up to yet. We have to still create that. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much for uh, fielding your questions for us, uh, Peter. Uh, there are quite a few more questions in the chat. So uh, if you'd like, uh, please do respond to those questions in the chat. Okay, thanks very much. I uh, appreciate the chance to to talk to you and to your audience, and I wish you well with the uh, with the world mood for uh, animal rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Singer. Thank you. Bye. So with that, we conclude. Um, the Q&A session for Professor Peter Singer. It has been an honor and a privilege to listen to his, um, to his presentation, to hear his answers. I know for me and many, I know he was the driving force behind why we entered this field and for everything we do in it, um, we can trace back to his views, his ideas. So this has been incredible. Um, now we will move on to our second speaker with apologies for the delay, um, Ms. Gauri Moliki, who will be speaking on the development of jurisprudence on animal rights. Lawyer Gauri Moliki is a leading animal welfare advocate in India with over two decades of work experience in her field. She has built an illustrious career as a subject matter expert in animal protection laws. She serves as a resource person and trainer for the purpose of building the capacities of law enforcement agencies in animal law. And for me personally, ha um, the cases that she has um, initiated have been a huge source of knowledge in my own research. So let's all uh, welcome Ms. Maliki. Um, as usual, the audience can send their questions. I think by now we've all figured out how. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Ms. Gauri Maliki. Thank you, Ankita, for inviting me. Um, it's been brilliant to listen to Dr. Peter. Uh, singer and uh, just a bit of a correction I'm not a lawyer by qualification it's uh, just by practice in three decades that I have come to become somewhat of a you know uh, an expert on the subject um, so I'm going to keep my presentation short it's uh, not going to be through slides but I want to examine how animals have come to be treated uh, you know as property in the beginning even currently, we look at them as property and the law treats them as property. But uh, how the paradigm is sort of shifting and how our treatment is in future, uh, how can we predict it looking at other movements uh, in history? So if we trace back to our movement, our, you know, the treatment of animals uh, during common law, uh, it was purely as property. Uh, of course, the owner of the animal had absolute right. He could destroy it. He could kill any animal that he owned for work purposes, of course. Uh, and wildlife was, of course, covered through qualified um, sort of uh, right, as in permissions of the crown would be needed to hunt, etc. It's only later, as we evolved as a society, uh, that we started understanding that while animals are lower beings, uh, our absolute dominion over them has to be a little more sensitized. It has to be sensitive and it has to have boundaries. Uh, it has to sort of come with a certain moral responsibility towards their well-being and a duty of care has to be inculcated into it. The questions of how far can the proprietary right go started to be asked um, whether you know animals are living beings and capable of being uh, capable of suffering could only be denied so far and um, dr singer had you know read out jeremy bentham's famous uh, quote uh, which said that uh, it doesn't matter what, you know whether they can speak or whether they can um, reason but moot question the the important question is that if they can suffer and that came to be sort of debated uh, when lord erkshain um, presented a bill in uh, you know the house of lords 
um, in in the 1809 it was defeated it was actually ridiculed um, and uh, all of animal rights that he spoke about from a, a anthropocentric perspective was sort of uh, not accepted by the house of commons and the bill was totally uh, ridiculed and defeated it was called the bill for prevention of malicious and wanton cruelty to animals uh, nothing much to speak of really uh, but a good first step a debate got sparked and which led to in 1822 a bill to be passed in the um, in england's parliament uh, for the first time but again what was the whole thought the thought was to not have distressing scenes of uh, working animals being beaten up on the streets or um, you know cattle being uh, beaten up in the farms uh, while they were working so it was to prevent people from getting distressed and uh, uh, killing property uh, or animal property of other people was sort of being punishable the same laws uh, sort of reflected in uh, the colonies, etc., as well, uh, such as in India. Our first law also was made uh, by the British Raj, and um, it covered only cruelty acts that were conducted in public. In fact, there's a very interesting case where uh, cranes, uh, you know, these birds were being transported by train uh, from one place to another, and to prevent them from freaking out and you know struggling their eyelids were stitched up uh, and the matter went to court uh, but uh, it was held not as a cruelty act because the act of stitching up the eyelids happened in a private space and not in public it happened at the farm and not in public so um, that case and and several others for instance in order to create an indigo dye the the color indigo uh, die cows had to be fed with mango leaves and not given any water and then their refuse would be extracted and and the dye would be made with it um some people thought that that was extremely cruel uh, to keep these cows feed them with mango leaves and not um, give them any water for prolonged periods to in order to uh, create that dye with their excreta um the matter went to court again uh, it was held that since that cruelty happened in a private space and not in public it would not be uh, a punishable offense under the then prevention of cruelty to animals act so so much was entrenched the anthropocentric uh, sort of sentiment into the act that uh, even when in 1960 the system started changing at least here in india uh, a distinction came to be made between necessary and unnecessary pain and suffering, as in what is required by humans, uh, you know, for husbandry practices or for eating or for removing uh, unwanted animals would be necessary pain and suffering, hence allowed. And that's how it is across the world. Um, our dietary practices, our uh, use of animals in experiments, in laboratories, in uh, for clothing, for any kind of, uh, you know, human employment or agribusiness uh, is all considered justifiable for economic reasons, for health reasons, for many, many reasons. And uh, largely, I would say, in my uh, opinion, that this is uh, an attitude of dominion that has uh, still persisted. It is likely to persist uh, um, for a very long time, not like... Uh, probably the anti-slavery movement or the gender equality movement, where very quickly uh, we understood that the, that the traditional biases and, and the way, you know, the, the fundamental ethical questions um, of freedom, autonomy, moral considerations are all basically the same. But there, there, were, there were much more similarity. There were humans uh, whose rights were uh, subjugated and hence the rectification was made within a couple of centuries uh, or probably uh, a little more time uh, the animal rights movement is going to take a much longer time period there are debates and there are uh, conversations that are happening between animal rights groups and uh, lawmakers now on personhood there are um, cases of habeas being filed, of course defeated, but filed at least in uh, in courts in uh, the US. There are two pronouncements in Indian courts where 
personhood was accorded to animals but uh, again the whole uh, nitty gritties of you know what kind of if there are rights then what would be the duties and how would you uh, who would be penalized the owner the operator the government uh, all kinds of questions arose which currently have no answers and that's why uh, the supreme court in india has set these judgments aside and uh, um, currently we are, we are still um, sort of thinking about more of animals in in terms of victims a good uh, step forward has been taken by um, certain governments where animals at least that have been abused and where crime has been held uh, to have happened against an animal uh, are protected uh, much the same way as uh, you know in a child abuse case uh, a child would be protected or in a woman abuse case the woman would be protected um, the same kind of protection is sort of coming into certain legislations and uh, i was happy to be at the helm of one such case in the supreme court in india where uh, uh, which demanded the government of india to create a regime where animals would be treated as victims if they were being uh, abused and not given back in the custody of the owner um, till the pendency of the trial and if at all the owner was found to be guilty the animals would not be given back to him and uh, would be kept with the government or in a safe custody in shelters etc forever this dep depriving a person of uh, you know the custody of an animal to which cruelty has happened is is i'd say a landmark uh, step forward in um, the shift of our perception of animals from merely property to something that jeremy bentham said uh, as a victim as somebody who has a capacity to suffer and hence uh, any future suffering should be prevented and that would be the duty of the courts and the governments to um, perform to prevent any future suffering so i'd say judicial rulings um, have been forever progressively expanding the scope of who is to be considered worthy of rights um, governments have always sort of dragged their feet on it because um, the minute you give more rights to animals or you know cast more duties upon hum on the humans looking after them uh, it becomes economically difficult uh, you know we were just discussing there is a labor cost there's employment there's so much so uh, governments usually being democratic uh, governments elected by people themselves uh, are bound to go slow on it and uh, that's where the judiciary steps in uh, which is why uh, for the longest time we had been advocating for uh, more and more uh, you know sensitization sessions of magistrates of judges of lawyers and that's what we've been doing um, a lot at least in this part uh, of the world and uh, i'm deeply appreciative of of uh, this moot as well it would probably expand the scope of the same where judges come from a perspective of uh, knowledge uh, regarding animal matters and not just um, you know the the same precedent uh, that they that their predecessors have been um, sort of pushing so pushing the boundaries uh, on rights is is happening but it's way too slow uh, the future is definitely green and vegan but um, so far uh, we have we have progressed very very little uh, for the hundreds of billions of animals that suffer every year we owe it to them to put every bit of our effort into it thank you so much uh miss moleki uh that was a wonderful talk uh i feel absolutely honored to share the same stage as you growing up as a indian law student your work over decades has been some of the fundamental things that we study in law school and and it's absolutely appreciative uh, the question that I'd like to start with is that uh, over the years, uh, you have worked in different uh, fields. For example, your work about the Gadi Mai Festival or Jali Kattu or captive elephants in India or the horse-drawn carriages. Have you felt that there is a difference in approach that 
India or other developing countries or third world countries would need to adopt as uh, as opposed to other westernized or developed countries as far as the animal rights movement is concerned do you think that there are some specialized approaches which work in some parts of the world and not others so while uh, there are some cultural differences there are of course cultural differences uh, across the world we found it uh, easier to use the local cultures and and sort of refine them take them to court you know uh, with a local flavor uh, it is more acceptable that way i'll give you an example i hail from a state called uttarakhand and that's where a lot of animal sacrifice used to happen and uh, had it been uh, you know any uh, other group or some other sort of culture uh, person hailing from another culture coming over there and challenging it it would probably have uh, sort of backfired because people become defensive about about their use of animals about any change in their custom if it's challenged so i'd uh, say my being a local helped a lot in not just securing a good judgment but also having it implemented across the state to abolish animal sacrifice altogether uh, so uh, for instance there's another state called nagaland where a lot of dog meat is consumed uh, we are encouraging the locals over there to start talking about it and because when you challenge a custom uh, some a practice that's been going on for a long time you need to understand the nerve uh, you know the the nerve centers and you need to understand uh, what can be challenged that would make people defensive and what can be challenged and how to make them accept and change uh, and usually it's a, a you know a deeper understanding of why they do things and what are their motivations and it differs from from place to place and uh, a lot of study and preparation just the fact that animals suffer um, is not enough uh, you know uh, understanding why people do it uh, and from what is what thinking process they're coming from uh, is just as important probably more important another example i'll give you uh, the jelly kattu matter huge horrific uh, you know barbaric torture of bulls that happens in uh, the southern uh, subcontinent um, it was simply defeated because uh, the local uh, population did not speak up for it and it was mostly um, PETA uh, and certain other organizations that were agitating about it in the Supreme Court and it was taken as an attack on the culture of that local population so uh, I, I th I'm a strong believer that rather than making the movement um, you know one versus the other uh, the other or just to make it adversarial um, sometimes backfires and hence uh, a collaborative approach a more understanding approach and um, through a lot of dialogue and uh, sensitization always helps but it differs from you know region to region thank you so much ma'am it's great to see and hear you again um so there is another question in the chat um, is it less of a sin to consume dairy from one's own cows? In India, some families' cows are treated as family members and are much better treated than their counterparts in family farms. Would that deem dairy products from such cows cruelty-free? Okay, there's a huge misconception and I'd like to clear it today. There is no such thing as keeping an animal as family and then extracting its uh, milk for consumption of humans. There is no such thing. And, uh, you know, I I'm sure that's some kind of a perception that, that the Western world has of India. Uh, it's absolutely untrue. Even people who keep uh, cows in their homes, one or two cows, it could be marginal farmers for subsistence farming. Um, they still impregnate the cow. They still do not keep the male offspring. And they still don't keep the cow once it's spent. So, um, you know, for, for the purpose of consumption of its milk, uh, if they're keeping any animal, even if it's a goat or a donkey or a cow or anything or a buff. Um, we've got more questions in the chat on uh, WhatsApp. Quite a few. I'm back. Yes, ma'am. Your uh, screen had frozen for a while, but I think it's now yeah. back for everyone, including yeah. me. Yes. Um, there's another question which uh, which reads: 
there is considerable waste of animal products like milk, honey, yogurt, etc. in the name of religion in India. Has the situation been improving? If not, how can it be improved? Uh, it's through sensitization that we can improve it. It is a gigantic waste, but it has been uh, reduced to a large extent. Earlier, there used to be some milk bathing of gods, etc. Um, like in most pagan religions, uh, there are customs like that. Uh, it has come down, and with a lot of sensitization, it has to be done. I think there are bigger problems of animal sacrifice in many um, parts of the country that need to be addressed more rigorously because that you know, gives a sanction, a religious sanction to uh, be violent to an animal. That I think is problematic to its core, uh, other than just a way of animal products. But yeah, you're right. It's it's a lot of sensitization uh, is required. Again, by being very, very sensitive to the very strong uh, cultural beliefs that people might have around it. Um, there is another question, ma'am. What are some of the most pressing legal challenges faced by animals in India today? And what strategies do you employ to address them? So the pressing legal challenges right now before the Honorable Supreme Court where uh, the Article 21 of the Constitution sort of brought animals to the threshold of right to life, not really right to life to them, but to the threshold of 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 that particular right uh, it was uh, accorded to them in 2014 by the honorable supreme court but it was sort of held down by a recent constitutional bench judgment uh, it is a you know a minor obstacle i'd say in the long run uh, it has to get rectified because the supreme court has uh, sort of while it is final uh, it is not infallible uh, it has made a certain misstep and uh, it has opened the Pandora's box uh, by allowing Jalika to, um, and you know, I refrain from calling it a sport, but an event such as bull taming of Jalika to or bullock cart racing or Kambala, which is like a buffalo race in, in mud and slime. Uh, it has opened the Pandora's box to allow buffalo fighting in Assam and probably in due course, Punjab will come up with a dog fighting. Uh, exception in the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, or cockfighting could be, you know, started off by Andhra Pradesh. So this Pandora's box has to be shut. Uh, it's going to take a long time, and this, I think, is the biggest legal challenge that we have before us. Uh, currently, the Supreme Court has um, sort of admitted seven, five review petitions, and um, we are hoping that that could succeed, uh, or else we'd find another legal way of uh, approaching them again. Of course, there is a, a very, very interesting case coming up. Uh, it's not before the Supreme Court, it's before a high court, but that's regarding the ban on battery cages. Uh, while the EU, like uh, Dr. Singh also mentioned, uh, has moved away from battery cages, but only to a slightly better regime of enriched cages. Uh, but in India, um, there are about, um, uh, you know, the 90% of our egg production comes from egg laying hens, which are kept in battery cages. Uh, and that's what we want to rectify. And that matter is going to be finally heard on the 22nd of February. So we're hoping that uh, something good comes out of that for the poor hens who cannot stand up straight, turn around even once in their lives. And sometimes they, you know, it, it's their life is worse than hell. Um, they never take two steps in their entire life. They only come out of their cages on the day that they are being sent for slaughter. So uh, even a tiny dif difference uh, to that suffering would uh, actually be huge for them. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question says, you mentioned the importance of coordination between different animal rights organizations and local populations in order to create consensus and support for legislative change. By what methods and how do you think this can be achieved? So while there are people from all over the world uh, who are in their own way advancing animal rights by talking to uh, you know their local population or you know some of them like 
somebody like me who sort of came into the movement uh, only for the um, sort of for the love of justice because what we dish out to animals is not fair it's ethically not acceptable uh, but there are people who sort of have uh, affinity to one species or another um, there is a need for national and international and regional forums of animal welfare which advance a uniformity in thought who sort of uh, uh, sensitize these groups towards priorities a lot of times we sort of uh, sing our own tunes although all of it together <laughs> plays like an orchestra but sometimes it's cacophony and a lot of animal rights groups are constantly um, squibbling with each other rather than uh, you know advancing it the the big fight between the abolitionists and the um, the the ones who want uh, you know treatment of animals regulated or the or refined uh, is um, sort of legendary and, and that's where we we spend more time actually um, fighting each other than uh, putting up a united front before lawmakers or before the people so more dialogue would 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 clear this up and while there is space for uh, reform for refinement for reduction uh, for everything each uh, you know organization should know or, or the the ecosystem of animal welfare uh, and all the uh, you know the the stakeholders in it uh, must know you know uh, or agree upon one common direction only when then will the movement really advance otherwise we're just pulling each other down one last question mm -hmm. ma'am in your opinion how can organizations such as wimla best play a role in further advancing the role of law in animal protection movement so while uh, there is a great need to uh, advance jurisprudence to advance more thinkers jurists uh, lawyers coming into the movement there is also a step need to go one step backwards um, you know a little deeper uh, probably you know sensitize children when they are not so conditioned uh, they're not so hardened in their thoughts uh, as adults are and you know when children probably they, they would not have those economic biases in their minds and they would be able to see the problem as it is um, so my effort uh, you know is also a lot on uh, getting children sensitized in schools um, a little spark of information there could actually uh, you know have so many more of people like us uh, in the near future who would grow up uh, developing those thoughts probably joining the movement and uh, talking about it with their friends like uh, like dr singh said uh, more conversations would happen and clean cleaner conversations can happen with children and uh, at a much younger age than uh, you know when they are already invested in in factory farming that uh, could be a way to go forward thank you so much ma'am ankita over to you thank you for that brilliant presentation and for engaging with um, with our audience we now um move to the thank next you. Final presentation of the day. So this is being delivered by Ms. Paula Sparks. Um, the topic is legal education. Where have all the animals gone? Lawyer Paula Sparks is chairperson of the UK Center for Animal Law, A Law. Before this, she was in practice as a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. She has an interest in animal law and regularly lectures and writes on topics around animal law and policy. And in addition to being a huge um, inspirational figure in my life, I am proud to call her a friend. Over to you, Ms. Sparks. Well, thank you so much, Anki, to your, your two generous as always, but I really appreciate the kind words. Um, so where can I start? In fact, I've recently been reading The Humans by Matt Haig, which I found to be a sweet, um, funny story looking at human nature 
from the perspective of an alien who's sent to Earth on a mission in human form. And in one of the earlier chapters, he has to work out what humans are all about from reading a glossy magazine. And as I was reading this, and Ankita kindly invited me to talk at this launch event, I found myself wondering what this alien in human form would discern about non-human animals if their first source of knowledge was a university law degree. Would they work out from the syllabus that animals other than humans existed? If they did, through perhaps reading about contract or tort or as part of an environmental law module, would our observer discern that other animals are conscious and sentient beings? In my experience, animal law is not embedded whole scale across the law syllabus curriculum in most universities. And there is not even an elective or module for law students to opt to study animal law, either as a black letter law topic, learning about the laws that do exist, or in a socio-legal context, looking at the ethics and the philosophy behind animal law. In 2007, Simon Brumman, in his paper, Creatures, the Academic Lawyer and the Socio-Legal Approach, Introducing Animal Law into the Legal Education Curriculum, found that only five of the 109 LLB law courses in the UK were delivering animal law or animal welfare law modules. In 2003, the Law Teacher Journal published an article that I co-wrote with Rachel Dunn, Debbie Rook and Tiffany Mitchell entitled Teaching Animal Law in UK Universities, Benefits, Challenges and Opportunities for Growth. And in this paper, we report our survey of the animal law landscape, which found that in the UK in 2022, there were 10 law schools now offering an animal law module and five non-law schools offering a course in animal welfare law and ethics. Yeah, there are many reasons why animal law is a worthy topic for integration into the law syllabus. In our 2003 paper, we argue that animal law is ideal for exploring the interconnectedness of law and ethics and provides a platform for the application of philosophical theories to real life dilemmas that affect the lives of students, such as the decision whether or not to eat meat. It is also an excellent subject for developing key transferable skills for law students, such as critical analysis, research and meeting. We also note that the laws can be complex and contradictory, with a single species being afforded different levels of protection across different settings. For example, the treatment of a rabbit at law varies dependent on whether the rabbit is a pet, used for meat, used as a test subject in scientific procedures, or lives in the wild. Consequently, it's the social category bestowed upon the rabbit that determines its treatment under the law. My apologies, my own dog going bonkers in the background. So we argue in the paper that this perversive nature of animal law allows students to identify links and concepts that straddle the boundaries of discrete law topics. For example, we say that a key area of animal law in recent years is the contentious issue of whether a non-human animal can be a legal person. This raises significant questions for lawyers. Should animals be granted legal rights? What legal rights should animals be given? How would this affect the continued use of animals by humans? The question of legal personhood for animals has been argued in numerous courts across the world, including in the United States, Argentina, Brazil, Pakistan, and more recently, Ecuador. Legal challenges such as these allow students to grapple with jurisprudential questions such as what is a legal right and what should be the morally relevant criteria for possession of a legal right. Relevant to this is the historical development of legal rights, including the exclusion of rights to other groups such as women and the enslaved, the latter not being recognised as legal persons, at least in Britain, until 1772, and in the United States later than that, I add. So matters of social justice pervade animal law because animals are sentient beings, some are also rational and autonomous, and all are vulnerable and powerless in the human realm. 
Therefore, we argue that animal law becomes an ideal module to challenge the preconceptions of the use of animals in society and to have difficult debates and discussions. Kerr too, that's Andrew Jensen Kerr in the paper Pedagogy in Translation, Teaching Animal Law in China in 2014, also highlights the complexities of teaching animal law in China. Our experience at ALAW is that there is a great deal of interest in animal law among students. As our 2023 paper highlights, ALAW employs a student officer, providing a source of information, guidance and support to students who are interested in animal law. It has over 100 student members at any given time, with many more attending student animal law events. For example, in 2020, 173 delegates signed up for a webinar about animal law careers. Um, Leg and Brummham in their paper reflecting on 25 years of teaching animal law, is it time for an international uh, crime of animal ecocide, write that 2019 marked the 25th anniversary of the introduction of animal law to the law degree at Liverpool John Moores University. It is the most successful such course in the United Kingdom, having been studied by 25 to 120 final year students each year. As a subject for legal education, the course has had a significant impact on individuals as evidenced in very positive feedback. It evidences that students become more aware of the environmental and ethical issues raised by human interactions with animals. Given the reasons outlined for teaching animal law, this begs the question posed in the presentation, where have all the animals gone? The answer is simple in fact that they were never there, at least not on the undergraduate law syllabus in the United Kingdom until around the 1990s, and then only in a small minority of university law schools. And that appears to be a similar picture throughout the world, despite our many and varied interactions with other animals daily. In fact, Raj Reddy, in his lecture on the rise of animal law education, a discipline whose time is now, talked about the invisibility of animals in legal education and elsewhere. Why is this? Well, Simon Brimman, in his 2017 paper, Creatures, the Academic Lawyer and a Socio-Legal Approach, Introducing Animal Law into the Legal Education Curriculum, suggests a number of possible reasons for the absence of animal law in the university legal education program. He says there appears to be a problem common to a number of applied law student subjects offered which are on the fringes of LLB law provision and heavily influenced by socio-legal studies. These include cultural legal studies, social welfare law, law and the human body, law, literature and film, gender and the law, religion, law and society, terrorism, law, women and law and many others. The only exception is environmental law, which appears on 24 of the 109 LLBs offered in the United Kingdom. It appears that animal law is subject to the same limiting effects experienced by other applied socio-legal subjects. They are taught by enthusiasts and their modules tend to move between universities with the staff to teach them. This contrasts with the success of animal law in other countries where academics consider it to have particular moral and philosophical importance. In my opinion, I think this latter reason is the crux, that while no doubt there is a tension in university legal education between teaching law as an academic discipline and preparing students for legal practice, and that can push out other areas of socio-legal interest, the predominant factor is that as a society, we have not historically attached moral or philosophical importance to animals. It is a problem rooted in history and touches upon our knowledge and understanding of animals and our attitudes towards them. My own knowledge in this area has been informed by the writings of such as Stephen Wise and Joyce Tischler, among others, whose contributions to legal education cannot be overestimated. Both have added significantly to our understanding of the development of animal law from ancient thinking to the modern day. 
We know, for example, that the ancient Greek philosophers believed in the great chain of being, a strict hierarchy of all life, starting with God and progressing, progressing down to the angels, demons, stars, princes, noblemen, uh, wild animals, trees and other plants and minerals. It was a strictly hierarchical world order and not all people were considered worthy of moral consideration. Those who were enslaved were considered unable to reason. They were described as a living tool and similarly animals were thought of as being created for the use of man. And the ancient Greeks had a profound influence on Western thinking, as can be seen in early Christianity, supporting the idea that animals were created for the purpose of man. God had dominion over every little living thing. Animals were created for man's benefit. This is the natural order and also divine in intention. Our scientific knowledge, too, about animals enabled this worldview, with philosophers such as René Descartes promoting the idea of animals as autonomous, like machines acting in response to stimuli but lacking in consciousness. It wasn't until the 18th century when we see an awakening in the movements that started to change the moral and intellectual basis for those social hierarchies, including Mary Wollenscraft's a vindication of the rights of women in 1792, which challenged the view that woman was created for man and argued against the subjugation of women in society and also incidentally spoke in favor of animals in education. Thomas Paine, 1791 to two, introducing the revolutionary concept that all men are born equal with equal, equal natural rights and the case of Somerset and Stuart in 1772 in Britain, leading to the abolition of slavery. It was in this era that we have Jeremy Bentham, as Peter Singer has uh, already described, asking this, uh, opposing this suggestion that the morally relevant criteria is not can they reason or can they talk, but can they suffer? However, despite these um, early uh, early green shoots there was still a complete absence of legal protection of animals for their own sake yes there were laws that provided for dispute mechanism resolution resolution for owners whose animals were damaged or caused damage and an emergence of conservation laws whose purpose was the protection of animals as resources but animals was not were not the subject of laws for their own sake we see evidence of the influence of concepts such as the great chain and of dominion over animals in legal writing in this era. Sir William Blackstone, who was a leading jurist of the day and lectured on English law and authored Blackstone Commentaries on the Law of England, 1765 to 1769, wrote that the earth and all things therein are the general property of mankind from the immediate gift of the creator. It's not surprising then that the early teaching about law did not encompass animals and our relationship with them outside of the paradigm of animals as property or resources. Indeed, it wasn't until 1822 in England that the first National Law Martins Act was passed to protect animals, or at least some animals to some extent, for their own sake. But even opposition to this bill was fierce and earlier attempts to pass animal protection legislation was effectively laughed out of Parliament. William Windham MP, who was opposed to the concept of legislation to protect animals, argued that the treatment of animals was a matter of morality, not for Parliament or the law. And although animal welfare law has developed incrementally since then, it was against this backdrop that university legal education was developing as an undergraduate program in the 19th century. In a historical context, it's probably not surprising then that we did not see the emergence of animal law education earlier. As we now know the world is not flat, so too we know now that animals are not autonomous, but conscious and sentient beings. Darwin too has changed our worldview fundamentally. We now understand that we are not separate from, but part of the animal kingdom. And I would suggest that our university undergraduate law syllabus on a much broader scale has not kept pace. 
However, uh, there are green shoots. The USA is arguably one of the leaders in animal law education. And in our paper, we note that multiple law schools in the USA teach animal law, and some are leading in the world, such as Harvard and Lewis and Clark Law School. We highlight Sankoff's research in 2007 to 8 that showed that 75 law faculties, that's 38% in the USA, were offering animal law courses. Raj Reddy, in the lecture I referred to earlier, The Rise of Animal Law Education, the discipline whose time is now, also notes that the Center for Animal Law Studies is no longer the, animal, the only animal law program in the US and that Michigan State, San Francisco, Harvard, South Texas College and others have developed the field. We also point to other animal law programs in Canada at the University of Alberta, in Australia at the University of Technology in Sydney, where there is an animal law casebook project. In India, the Animal Law Centre, the first of its kind set up in India by the National Academy of Legal Studies and Research, NALSA University of Law, in collaboration with the Humane Society International India in 2016. And that center has been offering the country's first advanced diploma since 2019 and a master's degree in animal protection law since 2021. In Brazil, Trajano de Almeida Silva's 2014 paper, Origins and Development of Teaching Animal Law in Brazil, says this. In this context, seminars, courses, lectures, congresses and research groups have been offered in universities to encourage students and researchers to develop animal law as a new field within Brazilian law schools. Still, a large number of law schools have inadequately trained students and researchers who finish their courses without ever discussing significant question points. How can Brazilians expand this world of knowledge? What are the steps to introduce a new paradigm that is pro-animal? Thus, pointing to both a similarity of problems, but also steps towards change. A study module in animal law is offered internationally online as a module by the Open University at Abo Academia University, making animal law in Finland accessible to Nordic countries and internationally. And I'm sure that there are many others that I have missed and apologies in advance for excluding universities from mention who are the impetus for change in their own countries. Um, I pointed to the acceleration of animal law in the United States. In the United Kingdom, a law created a LinkedIn group for animal law teachers to share knowledge, expertise and resources. We have a vibrant student group and we run an animal law ethics and policy conference to provide opportunities for sharing research and networking. And as the 2023 paper points out, the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law offers a law lecturer's workshop programme to support academics who may be lacking expertise or confidence to teach in this specialist field. The global research network too plays a vital part in this transformative process. And so we come to the mood, which is part of um, and central to this transformation uh, from older cultural norms to a progressive approach, accelerating change, providing an opportunity for law students whose law faculties do not provide those opportunities for learning, critical thinking and debate about our relationship with non-human animals expressed through the laws that protect them and advance their interests. This mood will be an important step, a vital step towards making animals visible again. Um, I'm very proud to be associated with it and the work of Ankita, the team and the Global Research Network in bringing this great initiative uh, to the fore. I know it's been a lot of hard work and commendations to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paula, for such an interesting presentation and for being with us today. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, our, our first question will be uh, following your presentation. How should ethical considerations be integrated into 
animal law education to ensure future lawyers are prepared to tackle moral dilemmas in animal rights cases? Uh, um, this, uh, this issue about how to introduce animals, how to make animals visible within the curriculum is the subject of many of the papers that I've cited and I'm happy to share a bibliography afterwards with people who want to read them in full. Um, and I was very conscious in bringing this to you that this is not, a lot of this is not my work. I'm not a leading academic. I've taught animal law um, for, I think, between about five and seven years on a very part-time basis. But there's so much good work going out there um, that is addressing these critical questions. To some extent, there's an integrative approach in which you make animals visible in the topics in which they haven't been in, they haven't been at the fore, um, whether that's in family law, tort, um, and contract in um, a way that is less anthropocentric, um, but um, reflects our relationship with animals in different ways. Um, but there are also opportunities, and we discussed this in the 2023 paper, of taking more socio-legal approach to animal ethics, um, looking both at the theories behind um, our laws and the philosophies behind them. Um, and at the same time, I think that can't be divorced from looking at some of the critical issues we have in a real world setting. Do animal welfare laws um achieve what they're set out to achieve let's look at what's said on the tin of animal welfare laws and what's actually delivered and so i think we have to take a dual approach i think we are assisted by the fact that there are more animal law textbooks now available the cambridge center um a textbook written by um, Sean and Raphael is an excellent book that should help with the teaching of law. Um, and the, the other textbooks are very available, Kathy Hesler's and others, really, I think, empower us to, um, to, to be able to deliver animal law ethics education um, in, in a way that perhaps you may have felt underconfident about in the past. Thank you so much. Um, next question is, well, thinking about the women law, how would such an organizational approach help facilitate improved education and training for students in the animal protection movement, in your opinion? Well, we have some direct experience of this. Um, the first animal law moot in the United Kingdom was actually uh, the Cecilia moot, named after the um, open in the case of Cecilia. Um, and that was run by one of our student members and triggered us to um, run a, a, a national moot. I think we've run it twice now. And it exposed students who had never really thought about the ethics around our relationship with animals to any completely new um, new thinking. And we're not, not intending to indoctrinate people or say you must think in this particular way, but actually just to realize that there is a debate, that there is something to discuss. Um, we found that really helpful in exposing students who'd never had that before. And I think students take that back to their own law faculties. And I would urge um, any students who are interested in this area to raise with their law faculties if there isn't an option, why there isn't an option, and to actually um, campaign for an option um, to, to make their voices heard that this is something they're interested in studying. And this is what we've heard from many students that they are interested in studying this. And that's also the feedback from um, the various papers that out as well so i think it does have an effect if we don't even think it's worth talking about as law students how are we going to attach importance to animal ethics as practitioners and lawmakers in the future it's got to start somewhere and i also really agree with the, la the last speaker that it should actually start a lot earlier and we should be looking at uh, animal education um, at primary 
preschool and secondary school, um, as well as further education. Thank you. Well, actually, are there cultural or societal societal attitudes that may influence universities' reluctance to introduce animal law modules? And if so, how can efforts be made to address and counteract these attitudes? In, in a way, I think it's even one step back. Uh, it's just not on um, the 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 radar of many deans of law schools it, it's it's not a conscious decision not to introduce animal law it's just not something that people have thought about um, and then there are the difficulties you know of actually empowering people to teach because i do understand the difficulties of people feeling are not confident enough to teach in, in a new developing area. And here again, I think there are differences and different barriers. For example, in the United States, um, there is a greater use of adjunct professors who come in with outside experience and teach. teach. And that really isn't the, the case in the United Kingdom. I was very fortunate in being invited to teach at Winchester and I was only teaching for a day a week over um, two terms, but I was able to do that alongside my work at A-Law, but very often those opportunities do not exist. So you're looking at existing law lecturers um, who are teaching a very broad syllabus and asking them to introduce a, a new and very challenging area. Uh, that they themselves haven't been taught about or necessarily had exposure to. Thank you so much. Well, I have a very short question uh, to ask to end the Q&A. Um, what common misconceptions about animal law do you encounter and how can legal education address and correct this misunderstanding? I think one, if I'm just going to pick one, um, is that we have animal welfare law based on the best science. In fact, and I really, um, this was really brought home to me by Mike Radford's book on animal welfare law, that the law is a compromise between various interest groups. It's not gold standard. Um, and we've also heard today and talked about the balance between human and animal interests. When I was younger, I thought, well, we must have really good animal welfare laws um, based on what we know protects animals. And actually, the reality is that it's a very much of a, you know, a compromise insofar as those animal welfare laws do exist. Well, thank you so much. And I'll end over to Akita again now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Parks, for the very insightful um, presentation and for engaging with our audience and helping us identify what uh, the needs of the need of the R is in terms of um, incorporating animal law into education. Um, thank, so thank you very much for that. And now we will move on to the Q&A session. But before we do that, we will take five minutes for the Vimlar team to say a few words. Uh, we weren't able to get to this earlier, so we're getting to it now. And I will also read out some quotes for members who um, couldn't make the presentation today. So let me start with Angie Vega, who wants uh, me to convey the legal recognition and advancement of animal rights has evolved differently and at different speeds across legal systems worldwide. Whether it is through concepts such as animal personhood, the integration of animals into the multi-species family framework, the acknowledgement of animal rights through the rights of nature or other cutting edge approaches, Vimlar brings together strategies and methodologies used around the world to train animal, uh, to train law students. This knowledge will benefit students so they can become well-rounded legal professionals with the skills to advance the interests of non-human animals in the courtroom in an increasingly globalized legal market. I am honored to collaborate with some of the best professionals in the field and especially for being able to bring Vimlar to Latin America and the Caribbean. Teslin. 
Hi everyone, um, I'm Cheslin Caesar. Um, I'm Bolada's co-regional director for sub in Africa. Uh, and through training future generations of lawyers in animal rights research and advocacy and highlighting issues of animal rights as well as the interrelationship with other global concerns, I really do believe that Vimnopolis provides an important step towards the advancements of laws um, and training towards the protection of animals on a global level. Thanks. Tulki? Hello everyone, I'm Dulki Seitavika from Sri Lanka and the Regional Co-Director for Southern Asia of uh, Wimla. Um, and my quote is, until every voice is heard, every cage is empty and every living being's right to life is respected, our la fight for animal rights will continue and Wimla is equipping the next generation of animal advocates for the journey ahead. Thank you. And now back to me. So I actually forgot Angie Vega's um, affiliation, but she is our regional co-director for Latin America and the Caribbean. And now I have a quote from our other regional co-director for Latin America and the Caribbean, who is um, Maria Francisca Tapia Thano. And she would like to say, it is evident that the legal categorization of non-human animals as mere things is incongruent with contemporary scientific understanding, ethical principles, and prevailing legal norms across the majority of nations globally. This classification represents a fundamental inconsistency and regrettably persists despite its profound discordance. As I step into my new role as regional co-director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Vimlar, I hope that we can play an integral role in educating young law students on animal rights law, encouraging change in our region, and fostering a global movement for the personhood of animals. And now we have Hanbit. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Hanbit from South Korea, and I am a regional director of South, uh, Eastern and Southeastern Asia. Um, why each country's animal issue are different, their animal laws and precedents can serve as an example for other countries. They or countries around the world are working to create better laws and policies for animals. Uh, in order to find the best solution for animals, countries can share their laws and policies to make things better. Uh, Wubin law will be an advancement for um, animal protection and the cooperation of the world. Thank you, and Imogen. Imogen. Hi everyone, my name is Imogen Stewart and I'm from the UK. Um, my message is short but sweet, but in addition to educating students about animal law through the competition and the training course, the Wilma has provided me with the opportunity to intern with them, which is really helping me to further my passion for animal law, so thank you. Michaela? Hi everyone, I'm Mikhaila Tefani. I am the regional co-director for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I wanted to share that animal law is an emerging field. It has the potential to offer vital protection to sentient beings, guarding them against cruelty and exploitation. It embodies our evolving ethical responsibilities, compassion and sustainability in our interactions with animals and the environment, shaping a more humane and harmonious world. Participating in the WIMLA equips young individuals with invaluable legal skills and a nuanced understanding of the intersection between law and animal welfare. Through their advocacy in such forums, they not only amplify the discourse on animal protection, but also contribute to fostering legal frameworks that prioritize the well-being of animals on a global scale. And finally, Shreya. Hi, so uh, I'm the head of content with Wimlar, and uh, I just feel like uh, animal rights is emerging as a frontier of social justice. And it's amazing that this exciting opportunity is being made available for students of law to explore the intersection of animal law with international law, so be it human rights, environment protection, or international trade. And I myself would have loved this opportunity while I was in university, but I'm just incredibly grateful that I get to be a part of this initiative and this revolution as thank you very much team um of course you already know this but without you none of this would go forward so my sincerest gratitude to each and every one of you for your support for your um 
for your great work and I'm excited and honored to be working with you as we as we take animal rights to a new frontier across the world. And now we move on to um, any questions the audience might have for our team. So we're here to answer anything you want to know about the Vemlar, about our presentations. Um, feel free to send them over through the YouTube or WhatsApp chats, and we will um, do our best to answer them. Um, OK, oh, welcome to our uh, Q&A on, on the session. Now uh, we will open uh, the floor to live question from our audience on Google Meet and YouTube channel. So if you have a question, please raise your hand or uh, type your question on chat. Uh, then we will address it as soon as possible. Okay, um, while we wait for any questions that might come in, um, I'd like to just give a little bit of information, uh, practical information on registration. So as Altamush mentioned, we are hoping to open registrations by um, the 26th of February, but likely the uh, kind of our, our limit is the 1st of March, by which we hope, uh, hope everything is in place to be able to open registrations. We will um, publicize this on our website and social media platforms and our marketing collaborators, um, hosts, and um, other affiliated organizations will aim to do the same. So it should reach you some way or the other. Um, and when it does, we encourage law schools to sign up um, with uh, participants. The registrations will close at different times for different regions, the idea being that we want to give all regions the same amount of time to prepare for the questions depending on the um, average term date. So of course we can't get it right throughout the region entirely, but our aim is to try to give everyone the same amount of prep time based on their term dates. So our memorial submission deadline and regional rounds are held in accordance with those. And before any of that can happen, we need to close the registration so we can make our agenda and um, set uh, important things like that, um, important information like that. So we will open registration likely on the 1st of March. Um, that is the long stop, so we really hope to get there. And then we will start closing them per region, as mentioned on the slides that Altamo shared. Um, we will share those slides with everyone. That information will be available on our website as well. So we can share them with the attendees and we can post them on the Vamlar website. So if um, anyone has um, needs any more information they can find them there or they can reach out to us through the um, inquiry box and we look forward to your participation so thank you for coming today and uh, we look forward to your continued support as we try to make this um, as important and as huge as the topic of animal rights deserves to be Thank you very much. And with that, we would like to close. Uh, once again, a huge thank you to our speakers for taking um, time and uh, the energy to be with us today um, to grace this occasion with uh, their wisdom and their knowledge. And it's it's been wonderful. Thank you to the GRN for organizing, for uh, Yoriko and Edna for supporting and everything they've done for us. And thank you to my wonderful team. Um, I cannot thank you enough for standing by me in this endeavor. And with that, I'd like to close. Oh, and of course, thank you to our hosts and marketing collaborators and everybody, everybody who has uh, helped make this a success.